there's a certain quality about nobles that is unique. I think there's a tremendous sense of caring, tremendous sense of gentlemanly behavior, a tremendous sense of all-out loyalty that is, is not as strong in many other schools. In 1967, I met Mr. Putnam because I was interviewing for an opening in the English department, which did result in my being hired and working at Nobles for over 27 years. I sensed something very special about this man and his school. I asked Mr. Putnam for an interview in 1978 and then followed up with other Nobles faculty to get a sense of the Nobles culture during his time. Clearly, Mr. Putnam was the right man at the right time to become Noble's third headmaster in its history. And ever since I joined the faculty in 1930, I felt that uh, Noble's was something that was very, very special but I don't think it's any different today with 400 students than it was in 1943 with 78. When uh, Lawrence Terry left Noble to go become headmaster of Middlesex, Elliot Putnam was, uh, uh, was promoted to uh, assistant headmaster. And of course he was all already a very prominent part of the faculty because of his personality, which was very outgoing. In a letter to the trustees, Mr. Putnam wrote, The ship is still on course, but the rigging is broken. We'll bring it to port, but from there on, I don't know where the future is. When matriculation got down to about 75 or 80 boys, and Mr. Putnam, through friends of mine's words, not only just reading about it, he used to go door to door, banging on doors, saying, I'd like your boy to come to Nobles. There were only 80 kids in the school, and Putnam would go over to Wellesley and knock on doors to try and get people to come to Nobles. Nobles was a very well-rounded school, and it didn't have a lot of terribly brilliant people. Uh, they just wanted people to do as well as they were capable of doing. I quickly became familiar with Elliot's style. Uh, he was very much in charge. He reminded me of a naval captain of a warship in command at the helm. Even when we were way down in enrollment back in the early 40s, we still had a tremendous spirit of loyalty and desire to assume positions of responsibility. Faculty wasn't paid anything. They were all expected to coach. Gradually, went from 80 to 125. If you were at a morning assembly in those days, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, you would see Dad standing in front of the hall with students at their desks, 160-odd desks, faculty lining the walls, and a blackboard up to his left and to his right on which Bob Warner had carefully put the, the calendar. They did do very well, I think, on nurturing the kids and relating to them. And they were able to do it in part because the school was small enough. Elliot Putnam was then and still is a force in my life. He not only taught French, at which I was fairly proficient, he coached the football. We had a very strong hockey team, thanks to Elliot. Every day of the six years that I was there, Elliot Putnam would ring the bell. We would all go to our seats in the main study hall, working from the youngest to the back of the study hall room where the first class sat. Dad would make announcements, talk about the schedule. Sometimes there would be a performance by the Noblonians. Once or twice a year, there would be a competition, of the, a, a quartet competition and a public speaking competition that was, which took place in the morning announcements. Or Dad would have one of his inspirational readings to, to, to read to the boys, to give them something to think about. A tall gentleman helping somebody, uh, Scott and his fatal trip to the South Pole, uh, Kipling's If. The true test of a man's character was how he would behave if he knew that he would never be found out. And it, it, at the beginning of the baseball season, Dad would read Casey at the Bat with a fine Irish brogue. 
he uh, was a very entertaining part of our lives. I think he would have denied that he was a piano player, but he could, he could plunk on the piano and, and sing, uh, did you ever beat your feet on the Mississippi mud? And they were talking about how cool Daddy was and at the new hockey rink. They said he came down, parked the car, came over to the rink, pulled out the cigarette, which he then graduated to Salem's, put it in his mouth and lit the filter. They thought this was the funniest. Major event every year was a school dance. There would be a dance band. It would be in the main floor of the castle. And we still use dance cards, so we'd negotiate a couple of weeks in advance, who was going to have what dance, and although you would keep first dance and last dance for yourself, you would trade off with your friends to uh, dance with their dates in between. Occasionally, I would bring home a boyfriend and one had a beard. My father said, nice guy, Reeds. Beard, but a nice guy. Whereas my mother would go, nice guy, love the beard. Mr. Putnam had one wonderful tradition, which I'm sure every graduating class remembers. Mr. Putnam sat on, in our year at least, he sat on the desk in front of us, smoked a cigarette, and he knocked the ashes into the cuff of his trousers. The boys should always remember that girls should be treated with great respect, as though they were on a pedestal. At table, he was famous for, for virtually obliterating his meals with salt. I grew up thinking that a real man not only used a lot of salt, but also spread it all over the table as he was shaking it. And when he shook the salt shaker as violently and broadly as he did, there was no need for me to ever salt my food because I captured all of his. A recommendation came from the National Association for Schools and Colleges that said, for its real service to education, we recommend an increase in nobles' enrollment for the kind of education and training it offers. I just hope that it will inspire and train young people to want to assume positions of prominence and leadership in the community into which they are going. Dad's favorite descriptive of a, of a teacher was he's a good schoolman which meant he was good at his, at his academic pursuits, and he taught well, but he also did everything else that needed to be done. Coaching, driving, surfacing the rink, uh, cleaning up after the boys, whatever. He valued good school men greatly, and there were many of them. Ben Lawson was the business manager while guarding all the school's monies and resources and, and managing the budget. We try to be as economical as we can, and I think we have succeeded pretty well. We operate, I think, with a certain Yankee frugality, and we use spaces to the utmost. I taught English, history for three or four years, Latin, geography. Uh, they tried to get me to teach French <laughs> until they heard my accent. German, of course, I've taught for Vernon Green, and uh, that's about the summary of it. I've taught general science once, I wasn't very good at it. <laughs> I haven't been bothered with a lot of foolish administration and discipline problems, and I've been able to teach, which is what I like to do best of all. I think Mr. Stora brought chemistry and biology uh, to us as young boys, and he used to do experiments for us in the lab, which is a, which is a little tiny little basement room. <laughs> and every now and then they'd go awry, <laughs> and you wouldn't have an explosion, but you'd have a, some go happen that what he didn't expect to happen. I have coached for three seasons, I think I'm correct in saying every one of those years. I have been the head of the social science department, advisor to the historical society, and the political society. I had an interview with Elliot Putnam and a little later with Richard Flood Sr. And I will never forget that morning. It was a very interesting time. It was wonderful to meet both those men. And it was what was to become the beginning of a saga in my life for which I have a great deal of gratitude. It always seemed that he was fair. My father, uh, Tim Russell, always uh, preached fairness in life. And maybe that is one reason why uh, Tim Russell and Elliot Putnam became so close.
The early 50s, people really were earnest about doing a good job, living up to Mr. Putnam's exhortations every morning to pay attention and to do your best. If we had 27 boys in our class, there might only be four, five, or six who had an honors average. A grade in the mid-70s was considered that you were doing perfectly good work. When the report cards came out, Elliot Putnam would handwrite at the bottom of every card, keep it up or get going or come see me in my office, whatever the case might be. I found myself in Mr. Putnam's office trying to answer what happened with this report card with these little scratchy letters on it. And I was caught red-handed and had, of course, no excuse. I learned a lesson from that the hard way. Our family tragedy in the mid-50s. My sister died of uh, cancer, a brain tumor in the fall. My brother died in a tragic accident. And so the two together was, it was a double whammy, which um, really put us back in our heels. My parents uh, rallied in good old New England stiff upper lip uh, manner, uh, carried on. Dad felt very strongly about, about, the, about sports as being essential to the well-rounded student. The younger students had the Mohawks and the Oneidas intramurals. I think we played one or two outside games. And he would gather us in a group, sitting down on the field, and he would stand and talk to us about sportsmanship and why it was that we were doing what we did. And uh, they were the same people coaching us every single year. Elliot Putnam, the football team, my father, the hockey team, Dave Horton, the baseball team, doubled in the basketball in the winter, Bob Warner um, crew, and Wilbur Storer um, started wrestling. Dad was football coach from, I think, sometime in the 30s, uh, through the 40s into the early 50s. His, his class of 1951 was the famous undefeated football team, seven games with a win against Milton. But as a coach, he was moderate, firm. I'll never forget going into the Milton game I, my junior year. He sat us down on the bench the other, and he talked about humility. He talked about uh, being focused on what you're doing. No rah-rah stuff, and uh, just didn't buy that. Old man Flood didn't need it really much. He was a great hockey coach. He said, you know, cheer with your lungs, cheer with your with clapping your hands, um, egg them on, and also you're not going to boo the other side. You knew when Elliot Putnam was standing on the sidelines, or in many cases standing in the end zone if it was a football game, and there was a little bit more that one might put into it if you knew that he was there. I remember once that uh, I was in the uh, study hall and I had, might have had a, a book that gave you the translations of the Latin. Mr. Lawson came in and he took the book away from me. And then that, he said that was bad. Mr. Putnam said, well, that's all right. I was a member of the boarding faculty for 41 years, and uh, yet I never felt that uh, whether they were day boys or boarding students, loyalty and uh, dedication, I think, was about equal. We were very grateful for the tutelage that we received from Peggy Lawson and Ellen Flood and Luby Cogashow and, of course, Laura Putnam in teaching us about the ways we can be very hospitable and welcoming to the Nobles family. And Prue Payne and Ileana Jones and Sally Flood, Trish Arnold and myself were always very grateful for their willingness to show us the way. She would often have the boys in after study hall. And she was charmed by them. You know, she just was great with them. I got a letter after she died of a young man who found you know, my father quite intimidating, but he said he found her just so warm and welcoming that it always made him feel less homesick. We put on a play at least once a year. The, the wives of the faculty were essential to the to production of plays. They, they, they planned the costumes, they set, arranged the sets, they, did, they directed the setting up of the stage in the old gym. So I went to see Mr. Putnam, and he was ever the gentleman. He always stood up when you came into the room. And I said, I would like to ask permission to have a donkey. Not a word was spoken for a few seconds, I suppose it would have been. Well, Prue, I don't see why not.
at the centenary anniversary, Mr. Putnam said in 1966, it takes a season to make a pumpkin, but it takes a hundred years to make an oak tree. I'm reasonably sure that the upper branches of the noble's oak are growing sturdy and sure. There have been some wonderful people connected with this school who have influenced me greatly in my life and who have had a tremendous impact on all the other nobles people. Elliot had managed to uh, continue uh, the kind of school that Mr. Wiggins had established when the school moved out to Dedham in the 1920s. Here was somebody who was wise, benevolent, kind, and a leadership person and was very reassuring to have him addressing us every morning. As a headmaster, he was strong, consistent, firm, respected. I felt all of those things. I was often asked by fellow students if it was difficult being the son of the headmaster. In fact, it wasn't. It was a joy. He treated me just like any other student. If I did poorly, he would let me know that. If, if he was disappointed in me, he'd let me know that. And if I did well, he would be pleased. He really didn't like people with airs. And yet I once in a while thought he could have airs if he wanted to. Good looking man, prominent family, great school. I would say he was a worldly and sensitive man who respected immensely good intellect and respected immensely good sportsmanship and respected immensely character, most of all. Um, and that's what he sought to bring out in the students that were at Noble and Greenough. Believed in when he took a kid, he was going to make that kid fly. And he did. He wanted to have local kids go to the school who were academic and could play sports. And that's versus going to the Andovers and the Exeters of the world. I am one of the first 10 African Americans to graduate from the school. And when he made the decision, that Noble should begin to reflect the greater community that is our state, that is our nation. Um, it's changed a lot of lives. The last years of the 60s were years that were increasingly difficult for my dad because he was trying to hold on to those things which he felt symbolically were important. Short hair was important to him. It implied a cleanliness on the outside, which would also indicate a cleanliness on the inside. If he saw shirt tails out, he would say, tuck your shirt tail in. And that met resistance in the latter part of the decade. Perhaps superficial, when one thinks about it initially, quite powerful symbols um, as it became clear as the, as the decade wore on. Mr. Putnam was sort of the inspirational person. Mr. Flood was the, the warm, personal, one-on-one -on -one is the person you would go to with a, a, a small problem or a question, and uh, very approachable, and uh, they made such a perfect team. Elliot watched and listened. Uh, it was a different world, and I think uh, it was time pretty soon uh, to, to move along. His portraits still stand there. I think he had a long tenure and a very, very uh, important one there, and certainly in expanding the school. I think they had a collective wisdom that guided the school very effectively. My heart is so full when I think about this school that I find it difficult to put all my feelings into the proper words. I always love the manliness and the strength of the single-sex school, but I'm simply delighted that it has turned out as well as it has with the co-education. One of the amazing things about nobles is they've only had six headmasters. That's an unusual fact, and not only is the school in the world that has that few people leading it, and all of whom were distinguished and able leaders. Nobles is at almost 28% diversity. We have men, we have women. The school really reflects the best and brightest across the board of all aspects of those things that I consider America. If I had a chance to write a letter, I'd say thank you. Mr. Putnam's legacy, I believe, echoes Emerson's opinion that an institution is the lengthened shadow of one man.